So in this presentation we're going to look at the role of the nephron in filtration and reabsorption. Now the kidney is made up of millions of these microscopic uh, tubules uh, called the nephron. So to start with we're going to look at the structure of the nephron. So remember that these are microscopic tubules, there are millions of them spread throughout the kidneys. So let's start at the beginning of it and anything that uh, brings uh, blood into the kidney is, is first of all called an artery in this case it's called the renal artery so our renal artery is this structure here renal artery okay so the renal artery leads into this um, vast network of uh, of of uh, arterioles, very, very small arterioles, in fact, capillaries, called the glomerulus. Glomerulus. Okay, so surrounding the glomerulus is this structure called the Bowman's capsule. Bowman's capsule. Okay, so the Bowman's capsule leads into this network of uh, tubules. So the first bit of it is called the proximal convoluting tubule. Proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, and proximal because its proximity, its closeness. To the Bowman's capsule. Convoluted because it twists and turns. Okay, so once we get past the proximal convoluted tubule, it goes down into this structure called the loop of Henle. So, loop of Henle, we've got a capital H, and there is a descending arm or limb. and ascending limb. Okay, once we get through the uh, the loop of Henle, we go into the distal convoluted tubule. distal convoluted tubule and finally into the collecting duct. Okay, so uh, blood is brought in through the renal artery. It is uh, filtration occurs across this Bowman's capsule and anything that's not uh, not uh, filtrated travels along through these capillary, these fine neck of capillaries where all sorts of things, so we've got filtration and reabsorption and, and secretion occurring, and finally we come out, the blood comes out clean in the renal vein. The final little bit here we're just going to, be, before moving on, is just to locate this in the, the, the gross anatomy of the kidney. So when I mean gross, I mean the larger part of the kidney. So if we draw a kind of a dashed line like that we see that anything above here is in the area called the cortex and that was our jelly like substance a bit brown in color and our dissecting uh, tools could go quite easily through the cortex underneath the cortex is the medulla region so the medulla region and so most of the loop of Henle is in the medulla so after the collecting duct, it will then join into the larger structure called the renal pelvis and then taken out via the ureter to the bladder. And then finally, when uh, nature calls, it goes from the bladder via the urethra uh, to outside the body. So the first part we're going to look at is this concept of filtration. So filtration. Now, filtration occurs under pressure. 
and it occurs under pressure because the capillaries leading in to this section in the glomerulus are much larger than the capillaries coming out of the glomerulus. So larger volumes of blood coming into the glomerulus, smaller volumes of blood are allowed to exit. So it increases the pressure. So anything that is small enough can cross this region here in the Bowman's capsule that we outlined before. So filtration occurs between the surface between the glomerulus, so between the glomerulus and the inner lining of the Bowman's capsule. Anything that is filtered out is then called glomerular filtrate. And it's called this because there are a lot of other processes in absorption and reabsorption and secretion. So it's called the glomerular filtrate to differentiate it from urine, the end product at the end of the nephron. So the substances that are filtered out are filtered out under pressure, but they have to be small enough to fit through the, the, the lining of the glomerulus and into the Bowman's capsule. So substances filtered into nephron, and these include large volumes of water, H2O, also includes amino acids, glucose, salts in ion form, and these include sodium ions, chlorine ions, potassium ions, bicarbonate ions, nitrogenous waste, and uh, drugs like uh, penicillin, uh, morphine, those sorts of things. Okay, so stuff that is toxic. So toxic molecules. The substances that are retained include red and white blood cells, and proteins, which are much too large to be filtered out. So that is the process of filtration. Next part we're going to look at is this idea of reabsorption. So once the filtrate has ended up into the first part of the nephron, which is the proximal convoluted tubule, we start to see reabsorption of the necessary materials occurring. So they're filtered selectively at various points along the nephron. And we're going to break that down, just talking about reabsorption at this point, and we'll deal with secretion after that. So to begin, we, we see active reabsorption. So active reabsorption. Basically, this means there is an expenditure of energy. And the cells that line the nephron have many, many mitochondria to provide this energy. So we see active reabsorption. We're going to use a red arrow for anything that is active, anything that requires energy. So across this section here, we see active reabsorption of amino acids. Glucose. Ions. So those include sodium, potassium, calcium ions are reabsorbed in this section. In fact, pretty much all, pretty much 100% of the amino acids and glucose are reabsorbed here. And we find about 65% of sodium 
65% of sodium, and, and uh, its partner in crime, chlorine ions are reabsorbed here. So they are actively reabsorbed. So what we also know is that when active reabsorption occurs, we also see passive movement, so osmosis of water. So osmosis of water. So we'll show that down here. So H2O moves via osmosis because we're starting to see a greater amount of 65% of the sodium chlorine ions move. We have a greater amount of ions in our uh, interstitial fluid and in, in the blood stream, so therefore water also moves via osmosis. The next part is the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle is really, really permeable to water. So we see passive movement by osmosis of water. In the ascending arm of the loop of Henle, however, we see that it's highly impermeable to water, but very, very permeable to the movement of salt. So we see sodium ions actively being moved out of the ascending arm of the loop of Henle in this region. The other thing to note in this region, which is a further dot point down the track, is that this loop of Henle is longer in organisms that produce more concentrated urine. Uh, and this is because more water is absorbed. So organisms that need to retain as much water as possible have a much larger loop of Henle. Organisms that have uh, plenty of water available, their struggle survival is not about water, would have a shorter loop of Henle. In the distal convoluted tubule, we now see some active reabsorption, so active reabsorption of sodium again, and chlorine ions, followed by again osmosis. So we see this continuing active reabsorption of sodium of ions and then passive movement via osmosis of water. We also see active reabsorption of bicarbonate ions in this section as well. So bicarbonate ions. Now remember when we talked about 100% of amino acids and glucose are reabsorbed very early on, our ions and our water are very much determined by how much is needed. If the body is dehydrating, more ions and water move via, first of all, active and then passive movement of the water. If the amount of water in the body is quite high, then this would decrease the amount of uh, active reabsorption of salts and movement of water via osmosis. So this whole section is very, very much dependent on what is needed at the time. So again, we see this active reabsorption of salt followed by osmosis of water and some active reabsorption of uh, bicarbonate ions. Finally, in the collecting duct, uh, this will lead into some further points about the chemicals that act on the collecting duct, but we see active movement of sodium ions. There is another process that occurs uh, in the collecting duct. Now this process sees the diffusion, so it's passive, and we can actually break that down to facilitate the diffusion. So it's the diffusion of urea. And it may seem strange that urea is moving into the interstitial, but what it does is actually draws out more water to retain as much water as possible. Urea then cycles around and is again um, moves or is secreted into the descending arm of the loop of Henle. So urea moves in via diffusion into the descending arm of the um, of the loop of Henle. So this constantly moves and it's all about getting as much water as possible. Now the final section we're going to look at is the process of secretion. Secretion. So secretion is important to make sure that we uh, rid the blood, so the blood is clean of any uh, any toxic, uh, toxic substances that are left over. So secretion also occurs both passively and actively, depending on whereabouts it is in uh, along the nephron. So first of all, what nitrogenous waste is not filtered from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule is passively um, or mainly passively secreted into the proximal uh, convoluted tubule. So we'll show that by blue to say that 
it is moving passively, mainly passively. So that is urea and ammonia. Now because there is so much uh, secretion, absorption, all sorts of things occurring, we're getting a lot of uh, reabsorption of sodium ions and potassium ions and then ammonia is moving um, back into the, to the uh, nephron for the proximal convoluted tubule. We also see some active movement of hydrogen ions and this is always to balance, so we can balance the pH. Now balancing the pH is also a very, very important part. So besides our hydrogen ions being actively reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule, we also see drugs like penicillin and morphine being actively reabsorbed here as well. So we have drugs being actively reabsorbed. So under the title of drugs. As mentioned before, there is passive movement by diffusion of urea into the descending arm of the loop of Henle. And this is all part of this cycling nature that allows for more water to be reabsorbed in the collecting tube. In the ascending arm, we see active secretion of potassium ions and active secretion of hydrogen ions. And again, this is to balance the pH in the blood. So secretion is actually a much simpler process. What we can see is that, uh, first of all, we have passive movement of urea at the very, very beginning, passive movement of urea, and, and that is clearly to get rid of as much toxic substances from the blood as possible. We don't want toxic stuff accumulating in the blood. To balance pH, we see hydrogen ions being secreted into the nephron. We also see drugs being secreted, and drugs that weren't removed in the filtrate, uh, like penicillin being secreted into the proximal convoluted tubule. Along the descending limb of the loop of Henle, we see urea passively moving into the, the nephron, and this is part of a cyclical action that occurs between the collecting duct and the descending limb of the, the loop of Henle. In the distance, distal sorry, convoluted tubule, we see active secretion of potassium and hydrogen ions, again, to balance pH.